Um, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for being here, EJ, and, and for writing this book. It asks, will liberals and moderates feud while America burns, or will these natural allies take advantage of a historic opportunity to defeat an increasingly radical form of conservatism? So let's break that down. Um, how do you define liberals and moderates? Um, oh, you would start with a definitional question, wouldn't you? I, I mean, I, I think my book was all wrong after watching last night's debates. Liberals, <laughs> liberals and moderates are getting along wonderfully. Um, <laughs> Let me just step back for a sec, if I could, which is I, I wrote this book because I was alar I am alarmed by where the country is going. I'm alarmed at the prospect that, uh, of what will happen to us if the president is reelected. Um, and I was worried that uh, progressives and moderates who agree on far more than they want to know uh, could well uh, get into a situation where they decide that the relatively small differences between them, and I know that differences are real and I don't minimize them, but the relatively small differences between them are so much smaller than the differences with the other side, with both President Trump and a radicalized uh, Republican Party. Um, and so I, I wanted to lay out, if you will, articles of conciliation um, and I joke at the beginning of the book that my efforts might be as welcomed as a family counselor walking into a quarrel, but that's what I was uh, trying to do. Um, definitional, I, I, I'm, and uh, Richard Nixon used to say when he hated a question, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> In this case, I'm glad you asked that question because I struggled over uh, the, the uh, um, you know, the definitions and which terms to pick. Progressive is relatively easy um, because progressives use the term themselves. I didn't use liberal because progressive is more all-encompassing. It does include very much democratic socialists, for example, and social, uh, social democrats. And the word liberal has become really complicated now um, because of the attacks on neoliberalism, you know, which is in more of a European sense an extreme market ideology. So um, by progressives, I really meant people who are broadly on the left side of the spectrum. Um, you know, certainly Bernie supporters, Warren supporters, but also some people scattered around among the other presidential candidates. Moderate is a much, was a much more difficult term, and I really struggle with what is the right word to use here. I didn't like centrists because I, the, the term centrist has come to bother me because in the middle of what? In the center of what? And I also feel that as the political conversation got pulled more, more and more steadily to the right since the rise of Ronald Reagan, a lot of people who desperately wanted to be centrists were just chasing the center off to the right. Um, moderates, I thought, referred to, um, was, a, was a more specific term, partly because it refers to some dispositional virtues, um, a sense that things are complicated, a sense of give and take. Uh, but it also refers broadly to a lot of people who might be seen as on the center left or in the middle of the Democratic Party, but if I could just finish real quick, a fair number of people who might once upon a time have been Republicans. There were, not only were there moderate Republicans, uh, there were even liberal Republicans, Republicans who were proud uh, to call themselves uh, liberal. Um, you know, your governor, Dan Evans, might well fall in that category, yeah. And it's not clear to me that he would fit in this party anymore. I had my uh, high school yearbook picture uh, taken in front of a poster of Jacob Javits of New York. He certainly wouldn't fit into this party. And, and in the current taxonomy, uh, Klobuchar, Buttigieg, Biden, you would put them in the moderate camp? More or less. Yes. Although, what, But the other point of the book is for, look at what they are proposing. Um, there's been a real revolt against the Reagan economic and political consensus. And the ideas they're putting forward are substantially more progressive than what moderates would have put forward even five, eight years ago. 
Um, the public option, which is now the moderate position compared to Medicare for All, was defeated in Congress. They couldn't get it through Congress when they passed the Affordable uh, Care Act. Mike Bloomberg's tax plan is remarkably progressive. Uh, and a and lot of people credit um, Bernie Sanders with bringing everyone in that direction. Do you agree right, with that? And I do too in the yeah. book, and yeah. that I think that um, whatever you think of Bernie Sanders, whether you think it's dangerous because he can't win or whether you're a supporter is, there is no question that his um, set of ideas really began to tug the political conversation in a new direction. Um, and again, even if you think, as I do, that moving immediately toward Medicare for all is A, not politically possible because it would not get through Congress, uh, and B, is probably not the right next step. I think the next step is to get everybody covered by any way you can. Um, oh, you can applaud that. We, we should <laughs> applaud universal coverage. Thank you. Um, uh, nonetheless, by putting that marker down, he helped redefine what the middle of that debate was. Free college is another one. First, it's not as radical as it sounds. We used to have virtually free public university education. I mean, there are probably some people uh, in this room who paid remarkably, if you're old enough, paid remarkably little to go to university. Uh, on the other hand, you might believe that we cannot, under these circumstances, afford uh, to provide that immediately for everybody. President Obama put two years of free community college on the table. There are steps we can take. And by the way, we also need to take steps for people who aren't college bound uh, to make sure that they get the one or two years after high school that would get them into good, good jobs. But so I credit Sanders with moving the conversation and with changing the nature of the bargaining in our politics. I mean, no one would bargain for a house by offering the asking price immediately, although I suppose in this housing market, maybe that's the only way you get a house. Um, but that's not where you start, or a new car. And I think that Sanders has laid down some markers that are actually helpful to the whole political uh, spectrum, including people who call themselves moderate. So your thesis is if liberals and moderates get together, they can take advantage of this historic opportunity. But as you've just kind of outlined, there are deep divisions between them on these two issues, in fact, on what ne we need to do for health care in the future, whether we need Medicare for all or whether we need a public option. And on education, we've got a division between those who say everyone should be entitled to a free college education and you've got Pete Buttigieg saying, no, the really wealthy should not be entitled to a free college education. So how do you thread the needle when you have progressives, liberals, and moderates on different sides of that? One side has to give. How do they get to the together? Well, you thread the needle because the other side wants to do absolutely nothing at all. And so your choice is, uh, do we have this argument and try to come to agreement on how to move forward? Or do we defeat each other and get absolutely nothing and possibly even have, for example, the Affordable Care Act repealed uh, in court? I mean, it's where people forget, and the president doesn't want to talk about it. His administration is in court trying to get the Affordable Care Act declared uh, unconstitutional. Um, and so the notion that they would take these differences um, and say, well, because of these differences, we're not going to hang together. We're going to let Donald Trump get reelected. We are going to let kids get put uh, into cages. We are going to let the Justice Department uh, violate the rule of law. Um, I, it seems to me that the challenge before us is so clear that they cannot allow these differences to get in the way of, uh, of allying together in the long run. And that is why the debate the, uh, last night was, well, was gonna, disturbing. That's, that I was getting to they should they could, but they're fighting more intensely than ever. Right, and there, it, I, I'm of two minds on that. On the one hand, everybody knows that in a fight, in a political fight, in primaries, people say all kinds of things to each other, and sometimes they come together afterward, and sometimes they don't. Uh, but it is not impossible for them to come together uh, at the end of this, and, and that's why while all this is going on, I'm, I'm happy um, you know, I'm happy that my book got published because I'm trying to make the argument, wait a minute, 
This may be on your TV tonight, but three months from now, if we are still in this place, we are going to deeply regret it. If I could underscore one other point, one of the things I say in the book, um, sorry, I'm turned this way. I want to say hello to the people on this side. Um, the, um, one of the things I talk about in the book is the power of negative thinking. Um, and by that, I mean that a lot of times we end up defining what we are for by first defining what we are against. And Ronald Reagan taught us some lessons on that. Remember, Ronald Reagan built basically a whole political ideology on being anti-government, anti-tax, and anti-communist. And out of that came a series of commitments. Um, in the case of Trump, I think he makes it clear what an awful lot of us across this very broad spectrum of opinion, what an awful lot of us are against. Uh, whether it has to do with the mistreatment of immigrants or the, what's happening to the rule of law or an attitude toward democracy and autocracy or corruption married to corporate dominance. These are all things that this broad spectrum uh, is opposed to. Um, and then we have legit arguments over exactly how to move forward from there. But let's remember that stopping these things is an essential step to moving forward. And that's a powerful pressure on all members of the Democratic Party to come together at some point in the future. But what do you think is going to be the most difficult thing for them to come together on when you're looking at liberals and moderates? What's the most tough issue for them to resolve so they can come together and campaign together? I think the, uh, the it, it's odd to say this because it's really an abstraction, but I think the word socialism uh, is creating a kind of division, and um, and this this the word is uh, and let's say democratic socialism because it's important to put that word democratic in front of it. Um, attitudes toward socialism are so deeply affected by what generation uh, you are in. Uh, it is not at all surprising that Americans under thirty, under thirty five have a much more negative view of capitalism and a much more positive view of socialism than Americans uh, who are older. Um, first, because Amer a lot of those Americans, young Americans, came into an economy that very nearly collapsed in 2008 um, because of real wrongdoing and irresponsibility on the part of capitalists. Uh, and it not they, so there was that fact plus the challenges they faced in entering the labor market, which were very different than the challenges of young people entering the labor market in 1998 or uh, when I entered the labor market long, long time ago. Um, and so their attitudes toward capitalism aren't as sort of robustly supportive. Secondly, the Cold War ended a long time ago. Uh, so when young people hear socialism, they don't think of the Soviet Union. Uh, they thought, think of the, one of the stars of the debate last night, Denmark. Um, you know, and Denmark is not a scary place. Denmark is a pretty, according to the, uh, some studies, the Danes are the happiest people in the world. Um, older people have a very different view of it. They have a more positive view of capitalism in general, and they associate it uh, with the Soviet Union. And so a poll taken by Gallup at the beginning of the year uh, if somebody were qualified in any way uh, uh, but were a socialist, would you vote for him? Uh, I think the number 63% of under 35 said yes, 42% of middle-aged people, 30, only 35% of people over 65. And I think this symbolic issue, I think, could have a powerful effect on the election. And, um, and it's, it's one of the things that I think might be worrisome about Sanders for some parts of the Democratic Party. Sanders' promise is that he will turn out lots more young people. Uh, and if he could pull that off, he could probably uh, win the election. Um, and by the way, I turned in my prognosticator's card about midnight on election night in 2016, my membership in the prognosticator's union. So I'm not going to tell you who can <laughs> win this election. Um, but I, I think that's a real challenge. So I, that's well, the issue because I think on single, pay, single payer is a good example yeah. because of what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said recently. Um, it almost made me think she read my book. Maybe that was wishful thinking <laughs> on my part. But she was actually quoted as saying, look, we're for single payer. Where else would you start a negotiation if we got 
a public option and covered everybody, would that be so bad? That's exactly right. So I, I think those issues can be dealt with, and, and you're watch, you watched as Elizabeth Warren evolved her position on that because she was struggling with many of the same issues a lot of other people are. You know, I just heard uh, an older African-American congressman on All Things Considered this evening talking about socialism and Bernie Sanders as being very frightening to him and people of his generation. Do you, I mean, and the youth vote tends to not be as much of a turnout as the older vote. So is it really going to matter in the end if young people are not as scared by this since they don't generally turn out in as great numbers as older people when it comes to this fear factor around the word democratic socialist? Right, well, the whole, uh, you know, the whole Sanders claim is that he can turn them out in a way no one else can. And it's very clear that there is an energy for Sanders uh, among young people, and he's carrying them by huge margins. In the fr he carried them in the first three contests by huge margins. On the other hand, their turnout wasn't up as dramatically as he would probably need in the election. Uh, but that is the question. The, the good news for the republic, whether you're for Sanders or not, is that youth turnout has actually climbed. The, the, the turnout of young people in 2018 uh, was much, much higher than past turnouts among young people in midterm elections. And incidentally, one of the themes, the first chapter of the book after the introduction is about the 2018 election as a model for what Democrats and Trump opponents um, need to do. Uh, to win in, in 2020. Just a, a fa one of my favorite facts about 2018, if you compare the vote for Democratic candidates for Congress in 2018 with the vote for Democratic candidates for Congress in 2014, Democrats got 25 million more votes in 2018. That's extraordinary. Uh, now, Republicans got 10 million more votes, uh, but that's a huge gap. I mean, the country understood the stakes of that election, but Democrats, there, was, there were both conversions and mobilization. Um, and th there's a formula there that we should think about seriously. When you look at the Democratic candidates and see them perform in the debates, is, are there some that you think would be better at kind of bringing liberals and moderates together and others you think might have more of a struggle doing that? Um, as I, we were talking before, I am still, I, I am one of those, um, uh, there was a poll I think here in, was it here in Washington that showed the Sanders is first and under, undecided is second? Yes, that just came uh, out. President undecided is on, our, on, our, on his way or her way. Um, I, so I, have, I haven't, uh, my, my state votes late, so I haven't had to decide yet. Um, I think you can see elements, I, I think Sanders, if he wins the nomination, he's clearly now as close as the front runner. Um, I'd like to see him do more outreach to the other side. And he's good, at, he's good at drawing lines, and I think that's one reason he's popular, because people see him drawing lines, you know, here I stand, I, will, you know, I can do no other. Um, but I, I think that, there was a period where Warren was casting herself precisely because she stood somewhere between the Sanders wing and the Biden Buttigieg Klobuchar, now Bloomberg wing, um, uh, you know, where she could play that role. But I, I think she may have lost her, her opportunity. Um, and then the moderates, I, I, you know, Biden as a, what, what, who would be seen as a kind of transitional figure I think would probably do it. He's a good coalition builder when it comes to the possibility of winning both white working class votes and African American votes. And I think that was always the appeal of Biden. Uh, people hoped he would be the candidate they saw on the stage in the debate with Paul Ryan. That hasn't always been uh, the case here. Um, and then Buttigieg and Klobuchar, Buttigieg has a very interesting, he, he talks a lot of the, he talks some of the talk very much that I'm talking here, which is, you know, basically we're all progressives and we have a different approach to how to, how to move forward. Um, and then I think Klobuchar showed some of that appeal, but only in New Hampshire. So I am not sure who is the best unifier at this point in the field. And I think that's part of the problem is just being candid about the state of the democratic field is, there, one of the reasons Sanders is running ahead is none of the other candidates has had the dominating position yet where 
people can look at that person and say, yeah, that person can bring us together. And that's why, you know, Mr. or Ms. Undecided is so strong. And that's why voters in both Iowa and New Hampshire, there were so many late deciding voters in those states. I went to the polls with a couple of friends in New Hampshire and uh, uh, husband and wife, and the husband decided on the walk to the polls because he was so torn. He went with his wife, by the way. She may have had something to do with it. <laughs> I, I mean, the Bernie Sanders brand is uncompromising democratic socialist. I mean, he wasn't even involved in the Democratic Party that much for many, many well, he's years. He's not a Democrat right now, actually. Oh, I didn't mention Bloomberg in my list. I worry about Bloomberg as a potentially divisive figure. I, on, your, on your air today, a caller said, I'm a Sanders supporter. I could vote for anybody except Bloomberg. Um, and I think his standing as a billionaire buying into the race, some of the support for Republican candidates um, is a problem. I mean, I would, if faced with that choice, Trump, Bloomberg, it's easy for me. I would vote for Bloomberg. And, you know, two things I do respect very much about him is he um, has given more support than just about anyone to the movement for sane gun laws. Uh, and that was very important. Um, and also, he's done a lot of work on climate. Nonetheless, I get it, because it bothers me that a billionaire uh, would do this. I, I tell people the story. Everybody has habits when they write, and I have this odd habit that when I hit a point where I'm not quite sure where I'm going, I pull out my phone and I play the hearts game on uh, my phone. I happen to love hearts. Um, and if you are not smart enough to put it in airplane mode, you get a lot of ads. Uh, on this app. Uh, and one day I discovered Mike Bloomberg is advertising in my hearts game. He is everywhere. I cannot escape Mike Bloomberg ads. Uh, and, you know, that, that's bothersome to, to, you know, the idea of a, a party that doesn't like Citizens United, that doesn't like the role of big money in politics. I think that'll be a block for some people. But do you see Bernie Sanders, should he get the nomination, as being the kind of a candidate, the kind of a personality that would reach out to moderates to bring them into the camp, which you see as the key to defeating Trump? Well, the first answer is, I hope so. Um, and the second answer is, I think he is a good politician. I mean, he, you, when you think about his whole history, to get elected, he started out in third party politics getting 2% of the vote and then eventually got elected mayor of Burlington, eventually got elected to Congress and then to the Senate. Um, so he is a good politician. Ironically, he, there are two things about him. One, Paul Krugman in the New York Times has made this point now several times. Bernie really is a social democrat. He's not a democratic socialist. I wrote that at a column four years ago. I said, come on, Bernie, you are a social democrat. Uh, and by using the Democratic Socialist label, he kind of radicalizes his, you know, his persona. I, in the book, I quote the two speeches he gave defining Democratic Socialism, and they're almost all about FDR and the New Deal. Um, now, Republicans at the time called FDR a socialist, but uh, you know, this is not as radical as the word Democratic Socialist uh, um, implies. Um, so the answer is, I think he would reach out, and he, he has worked with Democrats in Congress. You know, Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader, put him in the leadership of the Senate. He's worked well with a bunch of people, so he's certainly capable of that. Um, but it's not, it's obviously not his persona, and there would be some scratchiness in the transition, I suspect. You mentioned Biden as someone who might be able to bring uh, liberals and moderates together. Um, if he doesn't do well in South Carolina, can we pretty much write him off? Yeah, I, he's got to win South Carolina. I, I think my, again, I said I won't make predictions, but how do you chase a bookie from the track, you know? <laughs> um, the, um, I, I, I think after last night, I'll be very surprised if he doesn't win South Carolina. The question will be what kind of margin does he get? And I think uh, the Clyburn endorsement today is helpful. Um, you know, the one thing that, the only thing I think that could lead to his loss of South Carolina is if Steyer's vote is as big as it is in the polls. I think he's pulling that mostly from uh, Biden. There's, there's an irony um, in Bloomberg's candidacy because he was saying he was doing it because he wanted the party to put forward a more moderate nominee. But on Super Tuesday, he's going to be splitting votes with Joe Biden and all the rest of the moderates. There was 
a poll in Texas, Chris Hayes tonight on MSNBC mentioned this, um, that um, with uh, Bloomberg on the ballot, there, there was a poll that ran the race with and without Bloomberg. With Bloomberg on the ballot in Texas, he's, uh, Biden's tied with Sanders. With Bloomberg off the ballot, Biden's ahead of Sanders. So the impact, I mean, there's going to be, uh, people are going to have to hire political scientists to figure out how to vote if they don't want to vote for Bernie and they want to be effective. It's going to be very complicated. I'm just kind of wondering with Bloomberg coming into the race. I like the idea, by the way, of political scientists having extra ways of making money. We don't pay them very much. <laughs> But with, with Bloomberg coming into the race and Amy uh, Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg positioning themselves as moderates, you mentioned they might be the candidates that could bring the moderates and the liberals together, but they're decidedly second or third tier at this point. Is there any way forward for Klobuchar and Buttigieg? I don't see it um, at this point. I, I think that, I mean, I, find, I've, I met uh, Pete Buttigieg eight years ago and I admire him enormously. I think he's a brilliant, thoughtful person. Um, and yeah, there's got to be some fans out here. Uh, I even saw a Buddha Judge ad on TV today. So somebody is spending some money here. Um, so he really is a brilliant, thoughtful person. The fact that he cannot get African American votes is a real problem for a Democratic uh, candidate. Um, and you know, he did not have um, any real breakthrough. He got, I think, two percent of the African American vote in Nevada and ten percent of the Latino vote. I think this is a problem for him. And Klobuchar had her surge in New Hampshire, and it was really something to behold. That debate performance really, it, it shows how loosely affiliated so many Democrats are. She just surged ahead from a debate performance. Um, but in Iowa before and in Nevada after, there was no sign of movement. So I, I think one of the interesting questions, in fact, I was talking today to a political scientist about this, is if you are Bloomberg, if you are Buttigieg and Klobuchar, and you don't do well in South Carolina, what do you do? What is the responsible thing to do? Um, under Democratic Party rules, if you get 15 percent, you can get delegates. If your goal is to stop Bernie, and you had multiple candidates getting 15 percent, that would reduce his share of delegates. Thus, in New Hampshire, uh, Bernie got nine, Buttigieg got nine, Klobuchar got six. On the other hand, if the moderates split up all the votes and force each of them under 15 percent, um, then you could have exactly the opposite effect. And I, I don't think, you know, having only three days between South Carolina and Super Tuesday, again, makes these kind of calculations really difficult. Um, and um, as I said, I'm glad my state is voting later. <laughs> um, I, we have microphones here, and I'd like to go to your questions in a moment, but one more question before we do. So if you have some questions, please get in, uh, go to the microphones. And that has to do with uh, uh, Tom Friedman in the New York Times yesterday. We talked about this earlier. Uh, imagined uh, in an article called Dems, uh, you can defeat Trump in a landslide. He imagined a nominee. He says it might be Sanders or Bloomberg announcing a, a cabinet consisting of virtually all the other candidates, Amy Klobuchar, Vice President, Joe Biden, Secretary of State, uh, Bernie Sanders or Mike Bloomberg, Secretary of Treasury, Elizabeth Warren, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mitt Romney, Commerce Secretary, uh, Mayor Pete, Secretary of Home Security. What do you think about that? It's, in some ways, it seems to echo what you were saying about moderates and liberals getting together. Well, first of all, I, I don't know if, how many of you saw Tom Friedman's uh, column this morning, but uh, his reference to my book, I, I think as of right now, Tom Friedman is my favorite columnist in the world. You know? <laughs> um, the, uh, I should say Tom and I actually work together in Beirut, so if you're worried about negative politics here, try going to Beirut in the middle of the Civil War. Um, but I am, I am actually sympathetic to that idea. I've been toying with writing about how a brokered convention uh, could be a good thing, not a bad thing. Now, in this media age, if the broker convention looked like, say, last night's debate, then it would be a real problem. But the idea that a party where uh, I don't think um, there, there's no sign anytime soon that Bernie will command a majority of the popular vote in the Democratic Party, um, and to nominate a candidate who doesn't represent the majority of the party, can create problems. Trump did win, although he lost the popular vote by almost three million. 
Um, he got an inside straight in three states, thanks to our delightful electoral college. Um, the, um, um, but uh, to have a convention where people would work things out, including even discuss cabinet offices, it has happened before. Uh, we might remember that Abraham Lincoln was nominated on the third ballot and Franklin Roosevelt was nominated on the fourth ballot. We've done a whole lot worse. Uh, and so I, I was glad Tom actually took the book down that path because it's an interesting idea. Is it going to happen? Probably not. Uh, but I think that sort of coalition building in advance is not a terrible idea. Great. Let's go to your questions. What's your name and what's your question? Hi, I'm Anne. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is on the role of Congress versus the presidency. I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the policy positions of the presidential candidates, but in an age of such partisan politics in Congress, does the, par the policy positions of our presidential candidates even matter? Um, well, when you have um, at least one House of Congress that doesn't want to hold the president accountable for anything, the Congress doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I, I've got to say, I, as watching the debate over the impeachment, it was very depressing to me. It, was, it didn't shock me, given what's happened to the Republican Party, uh, that they didn't challenge Trump. Um, one of the arguments of the book, one of the reasons I argue that progressives and moderates inside the Democratic Party are having all these discussions um, is because uh, the, the Republicans are essentially missing in action on a lot of these uh, questions. Um, so there are ways in which we are witnessing an imperial presidency on steroids under President Trump. So um, on, on the other hand, you cannot, if you are on the broad progressive side of politics, the kinds of things you want to do require getting legislation through Congress. Uh, you can't expand health coverage without legislation through Congress. You can't uh, expand access to higher ed without getting legislation through Congress. You can't deal with climate change without getting legislation through Congress. So if we ever got to a time where we were ready to solve problems, um, then Congress would be a very vibrant place again. The difficulty is uh, with the polarization and with the um, you know, Republicans in many cases walking away from public action. If you did have a Democratic president with uh, a Republican Senate, say, assuming the Democrats held the House, it would be very, very difficult to pass anything. And a number of these candidates have responded to that by saying, here are all the things I'll do by executive order. Um, so it's a very tricky deal. In the shorthand that a couple of uh, Tom Mann and Norma Ernstein, my friends, uh, whom I wrote a book with a couple of years ago, but in their work on Congress, we basically have a parliamentary political system now, but it's superimposed on a non-parliamentary uh, structure. So we really do have a lack of fit between how our politics is actually working and the structure that we have now. And I don't know what we're gonna do about that, but I appreciate the question. Uh, my name is Tom, and um, in the interest of ways for political scientists to make more money. Uh, ideally, the DNC would have hired some of them maybe three, four years ago when they were mapping out the calendar. Um, so Wait, so they hired them three or four years ago? When they were mapping out the primary calendar. Um, in, I think it, they hired sorcerers or something. I, I, you know? I, 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 apparently. <laughs> so, but it, I mean, you touched on this a little, but I think one of the challenges for what you are talking about needs to happen is really challenged by the calendar that, leaving aside starting with two almost all white states, but then that all of a sudden we're gonna go from this period where you have seven people on stage to in you know the next 13 days deciding almost all the, or you know, half the delegates, um, to the point where it makes it much tougher to winnow down the field in a substantive way and actually get to somebody, whether it's Bernie or somebody else, getting a majority of the delegates that I think would actually help bring the two sides together. So your question is about the impact of the calendar on putting the, in the yes. situation we're in now. Yeah, I, I, the problem with um, these uh, reforming the primary system 
is that every reform is, seems to be based on the experience of four years before. Uh, and that this calendar turns out, um, I mean, it might work out great for Bernie Sanders, but the, the calendar doesn't match what the system has produced this time. Normally, um, you expect candidates to drop out after uh, losing Iowa or after losing New Hampshire or certainly after losing Iowa, New Hampshire, and Nevada. That hasn't happened this year for some, for a whole lot of reasons, some of which are maybe are not even clear, uh, but it's mainly because no, uh, none of the non-Bernies has emerged as dominant. Um, you've never had a situation where a candidate, not only, you've had candidates skip the early primaries, you've never had one with the resources to put the kind of money that Bloomberg has put into all of the states that came after uh, the first four. So this calendar was not built for what has actually happened uh, this year. Um, there have been a lot of people uh, who um, talk about a national primary. Uh, we're getting a look at what that looks like and I'm not sure we're gonna like it in the end. Again, I, I, you know, so much of how you look at this is we all look at the outcomes we want. And so right now, the person who is best positioned to take advantage of this calendar is Bernie. Um, could I just say one quick thing just so you know about the book? Um, a lot of the book is not about the sort of the politics we're talking about. I love talking politics. I could do it for two, three nights running in this great place. Um, but th there's, there's one kind of unity I do want to talk about that I mentioned in the book very briefly is um, we really need a better conversation in the country, I argue, around race and class. Um, and the, thank you. Um, we, when, when people look back on the Trump election, there's a debate over was it race and immigration and culture or was it economics? Um, and I argue that it's, it, it's a, there are two forms of the denial. I think one is to deny that race and racism was central to Trump's election. It was there, it was important. He was explicit about it. If, Republicans had used dog whistles in the past. He used a bullhorn uh, on these issues. Um, but if you look at the geography of the Trump vote, he tended to do best in places that were on the decline economically. Um, Hillary Clinton carried about 450 counties. Donald Trump carried 2,500 counties. Hillary Clinton's counties represented 64% of the GDP uh, of the country. Um, uh, so we've got to look at that and say, we've got to fight the racism and the nativism. Um, but we also have to say that there are some of those voters in those places who voted for Trump who are uh, open to conversion, who are open to another point of view. Democrats carried the governorships and the Senate seats in Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin by winning back 10 to 15% of the Trump voters. Uh, I think it's important to bear that in mind. Second, um, I talk about how arguments about identity politics are often misplaced. First, the very term identity politics, as Stacey Abrams said, we didn't invent identity politics, it was imposed on us. I was judged by the color of my skin. I preferred not to be, but once I was, I needed to fight against that. Um, and, but some of the opponents of identity politics say, well, you, you, we shouldn't talk about identity, we should talk about class. Uh, I think you need to talk about both. And I think as a country, we need to deal with both forms of inequality. Um, there's a great writer called Nancy Fraser who talks about a politics of redistribution, or you could just say distribution, uh, and a politics of recognition. Um, you do have to talk to the worker in, um, in Michigan or, or West Virginia or Pennsylvania, many of those workers, by the way, are African American and Latino, uh, about what's happened to them because of deindustrialization. But you also have to take seriously what an African American parent thinks when young African American men who are unarmed are shot by the police. You've got to take both sides of that seriously if you care about social justice. Uh, and I still have very fond memories of Bobby Kennedy because he talked about the equal dignity of everyone and in a campaign based on dignity pulled in 
people on both sides of this racial divide, and we desperately need to have that kind of conversation and someone who can address uh, both uh, address people on both sides of these divides, address pain on both sides of these divides. And again, dignity is one of the most important words in my book, and I think it's got to be the answer both for a post-Trump politics uh, and a post-Reagan economics. Thank you for letting me interrupt sure. myself. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, What's your name, sir? So, what's your question? My name is Hunter, and my question... Your name is... Hunter. Oh, great. Good to meet you. Uh, not... Joe Biden's, right. uh, the, the uh, other one. They, <laughs> <laughs> My question for you is this. Uh, since 1960, every successful Democratic presidential candidate has, so far as I can see, been a youngish, charismatic, very center of their party, um, governor or senator. So that's been the mold, I guess, for winning. My question is, in light of your book about the... Uh, challenges between uniting the left and the moderates or the left and the center. Is that why we don't have somebody in that model running who seems to be top tier? I mean, we have senators, right? But Bernie and um, Elizabeth seem to be a bit to the left of where most of their party is. Amy, I don't think has the charisma of maybe a JFK or a Barack Obama or a Bill Clinton or a Jimmy Carter. I just don't see the model we use from central casting at the forefront of who's being offered. So I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about why that is or whether it's a fluke in this particular go-round. Thank you. Thank you. For a second, I thought you were going to make a pitch for Pete Buttigieg because he would be, because you're not a governor or senator. Right. The, um, the, it is tr what you said is true that Democrat, you know, especially on the age thing, that Democrats for a very long period, you could actually take it all the way back, I think, to Woodrow Wilson, with the exception of Harry Truman, who succeeded you know, when FDR died. That Democrats have tended to win with younger, uh, younger candidates. So there is something uh, to that. I, you mentioned central casting. I think the guy or woman who runs it went on vacation this cycle. Um, because these aren't central casting. Uh, it's, it's hard to see uh, any of these candidates coming out of central casting, which normally we'd say, this is great, this is an unusual um, collection of people. Um, I think that, the, again, I think very odd things happen in this contest. For example, why aren't Cory Booker or, uh, yeah, I figured there'd be a Seattle uh, um, uh, audience for that. Why are, are Booker and Kamala Harris out of the race at this point? You know, she can give her a round of applause. She'd be, she'd be grateful. Um, um, and the answer is the peculiarity of the Biden candidacy, I think, which is that Biden was winning such overwhelming support from older African Americans that it made it hard for them to find the initial base uh, that they might be able to build their uh, their candidacies on. There are all kinds of other reasons why candidacies fail. I think in Harris's case, she couldn't decide whether she wanted to run primarily uh, as a more moderate candidate or primarily on the left, and it took her too long, I think, to figure that out. Um, but the, uh, the other part of it is uh, Democrats had a lot of their bench uh, sort of uh, removed by the elections of uh, 2010 uh, in 2014, and you've only replenished some of those, you know, backup figures, some of those rising figures in the big states in the 2018 election. So I think that had uh, something to do with it. And then there were just people hanging around who thought they didn't make it before and they could make it now. And that would be Bernie who lost. It's, it's quite common to have candidates lose and then win the nomination. And sometimes they win the presidency. You know, Ronald Reagan, Briefly ran in 68, he ran again in 76, and he got elected uh, in 80. Joe Biden lost uh, a couple of primaries. I always joke that I'm so old that I covered Joe Biden when he was the new generation candidate. Um, but the, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was the race that I am thinking of. Um, anyway, so I, I don't think there's, a, that, those are some suggestions. I don't know if there's any deeper uh, thing going on here. Or, um, 
Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, Chris Murphy of uh, Connecticut. I find an interesting figure. Um, Sherrod Brown was sort of your central casting figure in some ways who decided not to run uh, you know, f for whatever reason. I'm, not, I'm still not 100% sure why, but he would have been um, one of those uh, figures. Uh, I'm watching some of the governors. Gretchen Whitmer of uh, Michigan is an interesting figure to watch. A uh, Republican told me recently he thinks she's the one whoever wins should pick for vice president, so she's somebody I think to watch. There are a bunch of people coming up now, but thank you very much. Um, a great discussion. Too many white guys, so I'm going to go back over here. Could you? You, <laughs> you, know, the, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's great method is when she's picking audience members, she waits 30 seconds to a minute because she says guys always put their hands up and in order to call on women she has to wait because they're not, they, they, don't, they don't always think like guys do that they have all the answers or all the questions. Let's like, see what so. she thinks. What's your name and what's your question? My name's Stacy and I had this a little bit close to Hunter's question but do you think being a one-term president would be hurtful in the election now because with, given the age of the um, candidates you know, they're not going to last eight years. Uh, uh, no, I, I think that there's been a whole discussion of would Joe Biden have done better or do better by announcing straight up, I'm going to be a one-term president, because his argument is that we can't afford to have Donald Trump reelected, and we have to return to normal in order to move forward. Um, so... Uh, I don't think a one-term president um, is automatically a bad thing. Um, the, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, well, well, that's a. I'm, but I, I'm thinking even having a one-term president you might like better wouldn't be a bad, uh, a bad thing. And in yeah, in these circumstances, it's my, my view on this is uh, pretty clear. Uh, but thanks for the question, sir. My name is David. Uh, my question is about women. I've been surprised this cycle how many women I've talked to who think a woman cannot beat Donald Trump. And I'm wondering uh, what's that all about and if somehow we have to start talking about politics differently in this country before we'll have a woman president. You know, sometimes I think, thank you. You know, sometimes I think that the first woman president will be a conservative Republican. Uh, and I think that because the woman would have, the woman candidate would have appeal to uh, groups of people who might be uh, more conservative, more traditional, but would vote for the woman Republican. I, it's, you know, Margaret Thatcher was the first woman prime minister in Britain. I'm not sure that's totally accidental. So that's just a, a thought. Uh, on, on that. Uh, secondly, it, it's, I think, partly because Hillary Clinton lost and because sexism clearly played some role in her loss, women are actually, in some cases, uh, an awful lot of women are inclined to say, uh, we don't want that to happen again. We think the country is very sexist and therefore we don't want to take a chance and have Donald Trump be reelected. And there's a logic there. It's a tragic logic. It's a kind of sad logic. Uh, but I think it's not a shocking logic. In New Hampshire, and the, it didn't get much attention in the exit poll, but about a third of the Democrats said that they thought a woman would have less of a chance to beat Trump. And only 9% said that women would have more of a chance of beating Trump. So this is, uh, this is out there. It is, uh, most of the women I have talked to have been sort of baby boomers. And it may be real different among uh, Millennials. Yeah, I, I hear it some among millennials, although I, I, um, I'll never forget my daughter was, we were talking about politics when she, she's now, uh, this daughter is now 25, uh, but um, I, I, we were talking politics and I said, Julia, you could be the first woman president and proving that this is a possibility. She looked at me and said, Dad, why will it take that long? <laughs> Let's go over to this side. What's your name and what's your question? Um, my name is Ellen, and my question is, how could the debate structure be reformed to make it more effective for addressing real policy issues um, that are facing the country that are really important? You, and that could 
Modify the mud fest. It, my, the, my, somebody, if you couldn't hear, said modify the moderators. Um, the, um, no, no, but somebody in the front was responding, saying the way to moderate the mud fest is to modify the moderators, and it's all nice alliterative M words. Um, <laughs> The, um, I, I can't resist this because I've been a print reporter for so long, but there was a lot of discussion on Twitter saying, put print reporters on the panels. Um, the, uh, partly, it's really hard to have a good debate with that many candidates on, on the podium. Secondly, I wonder if there should be a mix of people that are not just journalists. I'm, I'm interested in how you might build a different panel. Um, but I think a lot of it is, the pr a lot of the mess we're seeing is the product of still too big a field. Um, it is really hard. The, re the Republican debates four years ago were no day at the beach uh, either, when, if you remember some of those Trump debates, and everybody is fighting for time, and, and somebody is always left out. Um, and, you know, that, so that's a structural thing with multiple candidates. Um, with, and then in this case, I think you had two dynamics yesterday that really made this much more difficult. On the one hand, you had a kind of urgency on the part of a lot of the field to hit either Bloomberg because of all the money he's spending or Bernie because he's the front runner. And so there was a lot of action that way. But then you had all these other candidates who wanted to be the uh, alternative to Bernie and Bloomberg, who were kind of scratching at each other to grab time. So I do think some of what was particularly awful last night, you could, I think it could have been moderated better, um, but I think some of it was built into the nature of the debate. So I don't see any way to have really great debates that involve uh, more than about three or four people. Uh, I think it's very, very difficult. We might look, I, I, maybe we should all go back and look at the Canadian debates, because Canadians have developed a multi-party system, and they, their debates seem to be more civilized, but maybe they're just more civilized than we are. <laughs> so. Thank you. My name is Philippa, and um, I, first, I came to the United States in 1972, and uh, in time for the Watergate hearings, so and I've been a, an avid follower of politics ever since. I'm now a citizen, so. Um, but I was in Britain uh, for the election in December, and very distressed, and wonder if you see any lessons for America in what happened in Britain in December of 2019. Could I ask you, is the you remember the Woody Allen movie where he put English under English subtitles translating what the person was saying? So I wanted to ask you, are you saying is Bernie Corbin? Is that your underlying question? <laughs> <laughs> are you being polite as people are out here? It's a nice place. You know? <laughs> I suppose you're right there. Um, I wasn't a fan of Jeremy Corbyn, and my whole family, who consider themselves to be pretty far on the left, were not either, um, and predicted that he would not do well, and he did even worse than they expected. So I worry about that here, and I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, by the way, Philippa is a wonderful British name. I know one other Philippa, and she is a brilliant BBC correspondent. So I think I know who you It's mean. very good to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, um, yeah, I, first of all, I actually think Corbyn is to the left of Bernie in a whole series of ways. So I don't think it's an exact metaphor, but I have thought of that too. I was, when I was a student in Britain, I was a card-carrying member of the Labour Party. Uh, I don't know if that makes me unelectable here, but it's too late for me to run for anything anyway. Um, but, and, and so I have deep affection for the Labour Party and its tradition, and you know, I grew up in a working class town, and I could, in the US, and I could identify with that great labor, working class tradition. Um, and Corbyn was a catastrophe for the party, and, the, the, uh, and he didn't deliver what he promised, in a sense, electorally, because you would think that um, a Corbyn candidacy with such a heavy emphasis on class politics could carry working class areas. And in fact, that's where the seats, so many of the seats uh, were lost. Um, so yeah, there could be a lesson in that. I mean, it's something, again, I'm, 
I, I'm one of those folks who, who I, I started writing about Bernie Sanders a long time ago, and I had a lot of respect for him. I feel a little like Pete Buttigieg, if, you were, if some of you may know, he wrote it, he won a prize in the Profiles in Courage competition for writing an essay on the courage of Bernie Sanders. So it's kind of fun to watch him on the stage against Bernie. And I'm somebody who, I've spent a lot of time with Bernie over the years, and I really like the fact that he has broadened our political imagination. And I like the fact that he's introduced these ideas. But I do worry about his electability. Uh, and I do take a look at what happened uh, um, in Britain and say we ought to think about that. But again, I, I, I think you agree with me if you could shout it out. I, I, I don't see Bernie as being quite as left, uh, or, I, or not quite as left. I just don't see Bernie as being as left as Corbyn is. No, I don't see him as being as left, but I worry about the rigidity, and I worry about the tightness of his... His entourage, yeah, no, that, and that was a real problem with Corbyn, yeah, thank you. No, the, the only thing I wanted to close with is, and I've been saying this a lot, there are two things just about the book itself. It talks, I talk about patriotism and nationalism, I talk about identity politics, I talk about an economics of, uh, of dignity, um, and I talk about, by the way, a new foreign policy, which we can talk about in the Q&A, but one of my favorite things in the book is not something I invented, it's something uh, that a political commentator, many of you know, Mark Shields, uh, spoke about. And one of my very favorite Mark Shields lines uh, is, uh, an observation he made that in politics as in religion, there are some people who hunt for heretics and some people who search for converts. And I think at this moment in history, particularly on the broad side of politics that I uh, am part of and I suspect most people who are nice enough to come out tonight are part of, I think if there's ever a time when we have to put aside heretic hunting and emphasize convert seeking, uh, it's in this election. And, and, thank you. And so I am deeply grateful you were here tonight. I'd love you to buy the book and sign it for you, but above all, I hope you can leave this room. It almost looks like a church. I hope you can leave this room as convert seekers. And bless you all for coming out tonight. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Jitian.